Hey, how's it going? <laughs> so, I'm sorry, like you guys are having some fun. <laughs> yeah, no, this is just this is a new experience for us, so we're having some fun with it. We're just like sitting in a room together, all on our phones, kind of like looking at each other. That's that's what we call family time. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of bands, like I know, even my band. We uh, we wind up getting together mostly just for rehearsals and playing shows, but um, it sounds it sounds like you guys like to to hang out together and and kick it too. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I think that, that sorry, it's kind of hard to speak when I can also hear myself right after. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. So it's like it seems it feels like sometimes the shows are just like a good excuse for us to kind of like get together a couple hours before and just like hang out and bool. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the, the way that a band's going to stay together is if you guys really enjoy each other's company, if it's, if it's just about the music, it, it's hard to, it's hard to make that work with uh you know especially with strong personalities like we were all friends before we were in the band like different so we're just gonna keep it that way and play yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, so no, we, we... we definitely find other opportunities to like hang out other than shows and stuff but you know it's it's you know, i'm sure you can relate where like sometimes it feels like like you, you like come to practice or something. You're like, we're not even really practicing. We're just kind of having fun together, and like <laughs> some music is involved. Yeah. Well, some sometimes we go to practice and we just wind up talking and like hanging out and talking for, you know, an hour and a half yeah. or two hours. It's like, where the hell did that time go? And then it's like, oh, well, we better we better get down to playing if we want to get anything done. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, its, that's its own kind of practice, you know. You're just practicing, you know, interacting with each other and stuff. I feel like it's that's still like beneficial in a way, you know. Totally. I, I mean, I I really feel like music is just almost another way of having a conversation with people. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Um, I kind of see it the same way. It also, or like it can also be a way to like initiate a conversation with people, you know? And like when you've got like, well, in our case, three other people who like, share, you know, we all, we all end up sharing the similar interest in, you know, our band. So like it helps to, you know, everyone has like a common goal to strive for. So it helps strengthen our bonds, you know? So why don't, just so that everybody who might be listening to this can can get a sense of like each of your voices uh, and who you are, if you could just kind of go around the room and each of you guys sort of introduce yourself, say you know what instrument you play, and uh, you know just maybe tell us something about yourself, like we're in first grade or something. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess I'll start since I've been the most talkative so far. This voice belongs to Griffin Lowe. I play the bass for the Furnace, and one thing about me is I speak English and Spanish and a little bit of German. A little bit of German. Um, can you int- can you introduce yourself to all our Spanish speaking and, and German fans too? Oh, oh my gosh! Okay, well, <laughs> Bienvenidos. Uh, me llamo me llamo Griffin. Uh, yo toco el, la guitarra de base para the Fernet. Um, it's bajo. Yo toco el bajo. <laughs> okay. Well, I think now we're getting into semantics. <laughs> Entonces, um, hello, uh, ich heiße Griffin. Um, ich spiele. That's about it for the German. I'm sorry. Like I said, a little bit of German. <laughs> Just a little bit. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Um, I'm Sean. I play guitar and I sing in the Fernets. Uh, I Griffin. Griffin had like three cool things. 
like English, Spanish, and German. I'm not very good at any of those, so yeah. I think I'll pass it. Um, I'm Curtis. I play the drums for the Furnace. Uh, Curtis Kunkel is my full name, in case you were wondering. And my fun fact is I don't have a belly button. What? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I just have like a five-inch scar on my I chest can, where it was. I can confirm it right now if you'd like. Sean likes to tell everyone it shows. It's um, a party spirit. All right, we're going to have to have an explanation of that. So um, I was born with my intestines on the outside of my body. This is the long and short of it. He actually just didn't want it, so he just, like, dropped it somewhere. <laughs> I'm really big into body modification. <laughs> wow, you're you're the first person I've ever I've ever met or talked to that didn't have a belly button. That's that's awesome. I mean, that you know of. I'm, I'm glad I could uh, that I know of. that experience yeah, I, for you. I I, I you never know. Check. I, I don't check for everybody I meet. So. Maybe you should. Yeah, maybe now you'll start. <laughs> All right, and I think Chris. It's Chris's turn. Yeah, yeah. So my name is Chris Castro. I play guitar in the front app, and I stole Curtis's belly button. <laughs> <laughs> and what'd you do with it? I added it to my own. So now it's just like a giant crater. <laughs> it would be kind of cool to have multiple belly buttons. Where would the second one go? Like, where would you put it? Um, I don't know. Probably in in my in my back. So it would but look I, like it, it like went through. It went that's not one, through. but two extra places to clean. Okay, call me crazy, but I would kind of want to put it on like one of my index fingers so I could just freak everyone out always. Yeah, point at them then, like, oh my God. Then you could pee out of your finger. I don't <laughs> think you know. I don't think that's how it works. I don't think Sean knows how peeing works. Dude, everyone knows the most optimal position is parallel to your nipple. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you, you got a point there. <laughs> yeah, no, Castro, I can't argue with you on that one. That's bulletproof. Or you should replace the nipple. If maybe they were just next to each other and you could, like, you know, oh, draw yeah. them, like, eyes or glasses or, or something like oh. that. Yeah. That could be cute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, I don't know if you guys know much about uh, my show, so I'll sort of introduce myself uh, and explain the show a little bit to you. Um, I'm Andy Kyler. The show is called Jams for Man. It's uh, basically a musical history of Northern Virginia, and I was I was born and raised in Reston, and uh, oh, yeah. and oh, a yeah, graduate <laughs> graduate of of South Lakes High School, class of '95. Oh, wow! And, That's the year I was okay. born. And Damn. um, attended several uh, Jam for Man concerts. And those were some of the first concerts I ever went to uh, on my own without my parents there. And the first ones that I ever went to that were real concerts in Reston. And the first ones where I saw guys that, like, you know, grew up in Reston and were in high school and were playing in bands Mm -hmm. and were rocking the shit out of the community center right in front of me. You should play at the community center, guys. I, I, I know people there. I work there. You work there? Yeah, I lifeguard there. Oh, holy shit. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, I should have talked to you a while ago when I was trying to set up the, uh, the anniversary show. Oh, man, uh, that would have been great. I've, I've been talking to the theater people forever about actually holding, like, concerts and stuff. I, I, I tried... They weren't particularly receptive, and I think that that's probably because they remember what it was like. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it was the coolest thing that ever happened in Reston, and uh, (laughs) you can imagine how, you know, adults felt about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, the... 
the show is kind of a tribute to the the name is a tribute to to Jam for Man, and um, you know it gives me an excuse to go back and find the people from those bands and talk to them about their music and play their music once again for people and kind of um, catalog the the history of all these bands that that played in Northern Virginia and were awesome that um, in some respects, time has just forgotten or has moved on from because a lot of their music was on, you know, tape or on record. It hasn't been digitized. It was on like VHS for their performances. And so the, you know, mm-hmm. the, the internet ha- hasn't been a, a good record of all of this. So I'm trying to, to amend that, but lost in, in that musical history are some of the recent bands. That, that have come out of Reston also. And so I know that the listeners want to hear and have talked about, we talked about on past shows, you know, what it's like for uh, current bands that, that come from Reston and what it, what it was like in the new millennium for bands to start and, and play there. Mm-hmm. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, like, it's, it's, well, like, hearing your whole, um, I feel like it's cheapening it to call it a spiel, but like, you know, the, everything that you just said, you know, like when you compare what we've had to do to like bands that actually have to worry about things, like, you know, if all of their music is on tape, then they're not going to be like, it, you know, that's only going to last for so long. It's only able to be distributed so far. Um, you know, compare that to us where we just like, you know, like Sean, Aaron and I, we were like 16, 17 and we, recorded a whole EP with just some freeware and a couple of mics and stuff. And then we were able to put it on the internet and it was freaking everywhere, you know, immediately pretty much, you know, it makes it feel like we we got a little easy, you know? It's a beautiful day to walk outside. It's a lovely day to tell me you love me And if you say you do, I'll go insane And if you say you don't, I'll blow my brains Tell me now or hold On my way to the gates of hell Tell me you don't feel the same You tell me you don't love me like that I know that we're just friends I can't be a part like this Don't you understand? Your boyfriend is alright Don't you understand? I will treat you better, better than him I think being from the Nova scene in general kind of has a weird place I like the East Coast music and national music because it's sandwiched between like DC, which is like home of, you know, hardcore, really like really great hardcore scene, really great punk scene, and now even like really good scene. And you have Richmond, um, who are kind of blossoming in their own way. They mean it's more like a small um scene with with Indy, um, which is like kind of our genre. And then of course you have like Guar. I mean, and Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Like, D'Angelo was born in Richmond, even though he's, like, a New York musician. So, um, in terms of, like, the scene stuff, I think it is a bit harder for Nova, Nova kids to kind of get a grip on, like, booking shows and making connections. 
that's a, yeah, you're right. That's true. Well, one of the like, things um, that you one of the things that you guys have over us is, um, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing at all. There was there was no template for how to how to do any kind of recording, what what gear to to buy, or how to um, how to book shows, how to um, how to do a tour anything like that. It was it was really hard to get all of that information. We had a lack of information. There was no place to go to to find that stuff out. The only place that you could go were to older bands and other guys who had done it and talk to them and find out from them what they were doing. There's one thing the internet's good for, it's for finding information. So, yeah, yeah, that's definitely like just having the internet in our back pocket. Um, like if, when we were start when we started book shows, and you know, I just type in Google like how to book shows. If you have zero fans, like stuff like that. Um, I mean, we would still like ask people in bands for help, but it wasn't like that wasn't the first and only channel that or avenue that we could take. So we've been really uh, like we've been really leaning on the internet as far as kind of everything goes. Um, releasing music, how to bring people to shows, how to be a good band, <laughs> which we're still not sure we've taken the how tos to heart yet, but you know, hopefully we'll yeah. get there. It's very flattering that she says that we know what we're doing. <laughs> well, I mean, I got it. I, I I really like the music that you guys are putting out. You know, I wouldn't have you on the show if I if I didn't think that you guys were making cool music. So that that that's your call. That's your calling card. That's where it all starts. You know, when people hear you, it's one thing for them to, to hear the name and you get them to your music where they can listen to something. But then, you know, the music has to be there for, for any sort of relationship with the listener to go any further at all. Now, that, that first song that they hear has to draw them in. Or they'll, you know, most people... There are so many other bands to listen to. There's so much music that 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 you could try out. Why bother with something that just sounds bad? I, I like to think that um, people might find out about us through our music that's recorded, but really we're at our best when we're playing live. Like I think a lot of bands that are like low budget and get their music out online it really pays to try and see them in person because it's going to sound a lot better there than it does on whatever cheap recording equipment they're using to put it online. And it's it's a more complete version of whatever that vision is at a time, at that time. In well, like to I the would, whole, you know, live, live music being just better most of the yeah, time. Yeah, you know? live music, live music. Yeah. It's, it's powerful. Like, that, that's, that's what it's there for. It's there to, you know, develop that connection with people where they're, you're in the moment and, and you're with one another. But, you yeah, know, sure. back, back, back in the day, a lot of bands, like, you know, I discovered so many bands because they were opening or playing other shows with other people or friends were just like, you know, we're going out to see this band come out and, and check out this show. And, you know, back then you would have to, you know, you'd have to buy a CD or buy the tape of the band or hear them on the radio in order to hear them. Or maybe somebody like dubbed you a tape and handed you a tape of it. But there was no, you know, there was no streaming of music. So if you wanted to hear somebody, you had to just go and check it out. Yeah. I think um, nowadays, uh, when you look at kind of, who, uh, I'm just going to point to like bedroom pop in particular because they have a lot of success with making a video low budget and making a song really low budget on GarageBand, putting it out, getting you know, many views, and you know, heading, you know, headlining national tours. I think there are a small group of people who do search for local music on streaming services and um, you know, like maybe local stores, real stores and stuff like that, I think it's still 
like local scenes still kind of are built upon and stem from people going to shows. Because like when you think of it, like you know, um, no one's looking, no one's looking for a band from Reston. Maybe people who are in other bands or from touring bands who are coming through Reston maybe need a show, or in that weird space between D.C. and Richmond or somewhere on the East Coast and you need a show. Like, but as far as like your average, uh, I don't say consumer, but you know, average music listener, um, I don't think they're like searching out local music. Um, they kind of get behind local artists more when they see them having success. And I think that's kind of a, not, I don't say a problem, but it's kind of like a pattern we've noticed. Well, so just tell me a little bit about those of you that, that did grow up in Reston. Um, what was your experience like just growing up in Reston, like in the, in the 2000s? Well, I loved it. Yeah, Reston is great. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I feel like most people go through that phase at some point where they're like, I hate my, I hate this town. <laughs> I got to leave. Not even. Um, well, congratulations. But anyway, <laughs> like, you know, at some point, you know, it can, you can get a little tired of it. But then, like, as I've gotten even older, I'm just kind of like, wait a second. Reston is actually a wonderful place. Yeah, for real. And I'm truly, like, grateful to have grown up in such a great area. I definitely agree. I just remember, like, I played around outside all the time when I was a kid, like, running around on the golf course. And then as I got older, I worked at all the pools in Reston. So I had, like, a, a pretty long, extensive, like, a relationship with the Reston Association that runs everything. But it's a really nice place. I will say, though, everyone here does say they're, like, from Reston. But most people are born in Fairfax. I was born and raised in Reston. Born in, <laughs> born in Reston Hospital, taken a couple miles away, and then raised in the rest of Reston. That's what I... That's, yeah. I'm a charlatan. I was born in D.C. and then moved here when I was, like, two. Oh. I can't remember not living in Reston, to be fair. And... What were what were any of the downsides of Reston? I mean, were did you guys have you know situations of of bullying or dealing with the cops or you know anything like that? Curtis definitely got bullied. No, that's not, that's <laughs> not man. I'm I'm, I'm good. Uh, um, cops suck. Reston is like a white people paradise. So you that take that for its ups and its downs, I guess. That's Reston. Um, it's full of lobbyists and lawyers. Yeah, I don't know. Like, Reston is pretty expensive. You know, I guess that wasn't really a downside growing up because that didn't affect me too much because, you know, a child doesn't handle finances. But, like, um, I mean, other than that, I can't really think of too much. I don't know. I feel like sometimes there's, like, a bit of a disconnect between, like, Reston and the rest of Nova in, like, one way or another. Um, but like, I don't know how much, I don't know how much that really has impacted like my development. Like I had plenty of good times in Reston slash Herndon. Like, I mean, that and, was great too. But. And where did you guys go to shows? Shows? Um, I think probably most of the concerts I went to. Um, we weren't, I mean, really not in Reston, now that I think about it. There's not many, very many venues, but like Jiffy Loop Live used to be the Nissan Pavilion. Uh, a couple places in D.C. or like rarely Jam and Java in Vienna would be the places I would go see music around here. I have fond memories of seeing Bowling for Soup at Jam and Java when I was like 14. Um, yeah, also Jiffy Loop Live, though. Um, that was like the first place I went to for a show. That was also, uh, that was also great. It was been playing too in my chemical romance. I was pretty happy with that. Um, and then, yeah, there. Were, I mean, that's the problem. Is like it, there aren't too many actual like venues or places to see music that like might resonate with me. Yeah, yeah like um, in like the immediate resting area. But then you know, like now that the metro's built and uh, really and everything, like DC's not. Far away at all, and 
there are plenty of places there. Yeah, and that's why uh, Griffin now has a venue at his house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and remember, we didn't have the Metro in Reston either. No, no. It's, yeah, it's right next to my house. I wish they had a whole time they were building it. Yeah, we had, we had to go all the way to Vienna if we wanted to, to take the Metro anywhere. I like West Falls Church. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, what what do you guys know of any of those other bands from Reston? Do you know anything of the history of Jam for Man or any of the bands that, that came before you? When when I think of a band, like, with people from Reston, like, that went to South Lakes that I listen to and I know of, the, I think of Red Gold Green. Um, I mean, they got pretty popular... Um, they have a relationship with like Pharrell and they make really awesome like go-go fusion music and I know at most if not all of their members went to South Lakes. thinking of like things I could have witnessed in Reston uh, as far as like a music scene goes I really wish I was here uh, for like the OG Lollapalooza <laughs> hell that yeah like, that's, that was like that's that's that was like three years before I was, it was it. But when I think the video like, of it on YouTube like Pearl Jam going up for their set and I'm just like damn I wish I was there you didn't know I was there right? oh dude there's like this oh people there. what that's it's crazy really, that's why like you can't do shows at like Fairfax. Oh wow. anymore. <laughs> it's, no, it's funny actually. Um, so like, um, during during the uh, general election, um, our friends band was trying to set up kind of a a rally against Trump, and um, so they they were going to try and have it at Southgate Community Center, um, and everything was going fine, and then. Um, Someone from Rest in Patch post, posted something about the show, just in, in like a, a good-hearted way, just like, hey, you know, this is happening, come out if you'd like. Um, but it got so much backlash that Southgate Community Center actually backed out of it, and we were like trying to find other venues to do that. And we were like, what about like Fairfax? And they're like, oh no, we cannot do like Fairfax. They won't do anything ever since Lollapalooza. Yeah, they won't allow any any electrified music. It's a damn shame. Uh, it's like crazy, there, man. Uh, yeah. Well, well, well yeah. Doing I, the I, it looks like 100 guitars. So tell me about um, the beginnings of your band. It was, it, I think it was just, um, it was just two of you and not even, and, and Aaron was a guy that's not even still with you anymore, right? So it was just yeah. uh, Sean, you, and, and that dude, Aaron. Yeah, so it was me and my uh, best friend, Aaron, uh, and we just kind of, well, we had been in a band with Griffin prior, actually, uh, so we knew Griffin from that, um, but me and Aaron started jamming, and uh, we didn't really expect anything to come out of it, and then I was like, you know what, maybe I can sing, uh, you know, if I try hard enough, and, you know, I think I'm almost there. Uh, but time will tell. But it was me and Aaron started jamming, went through some bassists, uh, found Griffin. We actually played a show with Griffin's old band, uh, also from Essen, and 
uh, they broke up soon after, and Griffin was like, you guys need a basis, and we were like, yeah, and we miss you, and we love you, so Griffin came over, joined the band, and uh, Aaron left soon after, um, and Curtis joined. And, and, why uh, did, and why did Aaron leave? Uh, it was just like a time thing. It wasn't like, I mean, we're still all like best buddies. Um, he, he's like two rooms over right now. He's in the living room. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just like, I think he wanted to focus on school and he had some other stuff he had to take care of. So, uh, yeah, Curtis kind of came along. Curtis was in Thailand. Ta- I was in Taiwan when you guys invited me into the band. I was like, sweet. My my, my last band like broke up three weeks earlier. And, and so how my- how was... How were those first batch of songs kind of different from what you guys are playing now? Oh, the first, the first batch of songs is terrible. Oh, he's wrong. They're, they're, they're wonderful. They're just different. So I mean, the first time I ever heard them, I was playing in my other band, um, and we were all playing a show together at this, like, music studio, I guess. And I, I heard the Furnats. I really wasn't a fan until I joined the band. And then I listened to the music a lot more. And I was like, okay, this is really good. Um, and then I was there in, like, in the room for a lot of recording of the original EP. It was, it was cool. I like it. I will say uh, I was the last one to join the band. Um, and I bumped that like EP all summer long. <laughs> yeah, he, Chris was the last to join the band, but he was the first fan. And... Mm-hmm. I will never forget that. Um, but to like kind of describe more how like the music has changed. I don't know. I think a lot of it's just that not only have we developed as musicians, but we've like, like, we're, yeah, I mean, we're not listening to the same stuff we were listening to however long ago it was that we did that. I don't really want to think about that right now. Um, but like, you know, we, we have new influences to draw off of, um, we kind of see that we're capable of doing, you know, the bare minimum for like song song building. But now we're like, okay, what else can we add to this? Like, what can we do to make this music that we enjoy even more? Not to mention, but thanks to like a lot of our good friends, the recordings themselves have gotten a lot better with like each each release. Oh, for sure. The, the yeah. quality of the actual recordings is much much better. So like the the album we put out, Fear or Not, that was all kind of recorded very DIY um, in Griffin's basement with one of our, a couple of our friends. Um, and then that was a, a long process of us just sitting in front of a computer and kind of figuring out how stuff worked. Uh, and then this new song we actually just put out, um, that was kind of, songwriting-wise, that was that was more us pushing ourselves. Um, and we're releasing a new album soon, but I mean that's kind of a result of us pushing ourselves as musicians and songwriters, kind of saying like, okay, we can you know we can write verse, chorus, verse, chorus, uh, but more, how can we take it to the next level and still make it more, you know, enjoyable and dynamic, and how can we kind of tap into each other's talents as musicians. Your your friend that you recorded with is also in a band, right? They're, yeah. Uh, they, he's in. Uh, I, I'm gonna screw up the the pronunciation of this band, but Roost de Guerre. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nailed it. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, I'm not. I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce his name. Hapa Tulingalu. How, how did he help you with the recording? Oh. I'd say he's, he's like the engineer as well as the producer. Yeah, so for Fear Not, um, he was the one who was recording all of the tracks for us, and he was um, doing the production, and then we have another friend, Nate Graves, who... Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. So for Fear Not, Hoppe did the uh, mixing, too, right? Yeah, he did the mixing, too. Yeah, so... Yeah, so... Yeah, so um, Hoppe did a lot of the actual, like, sound engineering for Fear Not, and then the mastering process, we gave yeah. that over to our good friend, Nate Graves. Um, the producer role with us is, I think, I think with us is a little less defined than other, I don't want to say other bands, because that's not like, you know, we're not like the other bands, but um, a lot of producer roles, I feel like are one dug in and one person. So it's kind of all of us just like, basically like shitting 
on to the sound engineer what would sound good, and then like the sound engineer slash producer, I guess, kind of be like, okay, like eight of your ideas out of ten are terrible, but maybe these two will work. Yeah, um, and that's kind of how the producer always develops on this. I think. Yeah, it felt it felt like a bit of a like a big powwow. Basically, we were. It was like, okay, so we know we need something extra here what would fit best and then you know we listen to it some more and we mess around with different things one of us says hey maybe we can do this and Hoppet says hey i added like a midi organ here what do you think of it and we would go oh this is great or oh this is not as great but i like where it's going maybe we can do this thing or that thing it was it was it was really collaborative at the end of the day i think for like a lot of the parts of the album and were you guys listening to a lot of early 90s music? Were you listening to, I don't know, Weezer or Pavement? But a lot of that influence from the start, especially for Fear Not, um, was definitely like Weezer, those like kind of early 90s all-rock bands, even the 2000s all-rock bands. Like I think a lot of people don't want to admit in our genre, like, yeah, like fucking like three doors down. You know, they're like I, I hear I hear some of the strokes too. Yeah. Especially oh, yeah. on like the, the second song. Is that dream? I think that's dream. I, yeah, I, dream. I will say uh before I let anyone continue is um so they let me hear the song early before I was in the band and the first thing I said was that Sean sounded like uh Julian Casablanca in that song. So just I called it. <laughs> have that that like low voice and sort of that um you know that that very dry straightforward delivery yeah i was going for elephant but you know (laughs) (laughs) yeah for dreams specifically that was one of the songs that while we were like coming up for like the different parts of it i was like this sounds really strokesy so i should really probably just like follow that main guitar line and just like feel that deal the first time i ever heard the furnace i heard um she don't understand on el dorado and i thought the lead guitar during the chorus it reminded me of reptilia by the strokes and that was like the first furnace song i ever heard yeah well i you know i love the strokes personally but they've they it feels like they've gotten a a a bad rap to some extent and you know people don't always cite them as an influence it's it's cool to hear you guys like that because yeah, they, in, the, in the early 2000s you know they were they were huge and you you yeah. couldn't go go anywhere the without us. in the mid 2000s yeah. and uh yeah. and they also both of those bands put on great great live shows mm-hmm. i saw both i saw both of those bands live and oh, you know they were amazing I think with with that kind of uh, music in terms of great live shows, I think uh, Cage the Elephant really took that torch. And, yeah, we and, take a lot from Cage. Yeah, I will yeah, say um, I saw Cage the Elephant in October, and it's hands down the best live show that I've ever been to. Yeah, I think with our um, songwriting and kind of song, like our, our formula is how we do it, is we kind of mix up a lot of those 90s all 2000s bands um and the and like they're kind of like almost 50 doo-wop and 60s pop bands like Roy Orbison, Paul Anka and try to like make it work like that um definitely we all grew up on those 90s all and 2000s all bands 
when, when we write a song, Sean basically just shows up, and then we all just play what makes sense and what sounds good to us, and then that's how it becomes a song. So whatever music taste each of us have as individuals definitely goes into the songs directly because we just write them spontaneously. In terms of the shaping of, of Fear Not, um, I mean, the, the, the name itself is so obvious because of the connection to the band name. And yet at the same time, it's, you know, it's pretty clever. Yeah. That's, that's, thank, thank you. you man. <laughs> so, so this next one, I wanted to call it for not, but they were like, that's dumb. <laughs> we're not doing it. Too on the nose, man. We how, can't. <laughs> how about, how about for not? Honestly, that might be easier for people to type in when I tell it to them. <laughs> Whenever I'm like, yeah, we're the Furnace, they're like, F U R. Like, no, no. <laughs> um, and what about the um, what about the photo uh, for the cover? How did you guys how did you guys arrange that? Take your wish, on. Yeah, so that's actually. Uh, that was kind of a, a concept that me and um, my ex-girlfriend, actually Chanel, we uh, were kind of working together on, um, and we wanted something that was really, that kind of popped out of people. Uh, we liked, like, the Lichtenstein uh, pop art aspect of things. Um, we liked really vibrant colors. But, uh, yeah, so... We just we just kind of took that um, really to play with contrast, um, and we knew we wanted. I think the theme of the album was kind of. I think I only think almost high school in general. I wrote most of the songs in junior and senior year of high school, um, so and like you know all high school boys, I think their fascination is on opposite gender. Um, you know, just love songs in general. Weed, alcohol. First for everything. Um, so, fruit? Oh, yeah, no, I <laughs> guess we do have kind of a fruit motif yeah, going on. We love that shit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just a great, like, natural plants like that in general. It's just such an easy thing to, like, you know, you say strawberry and everyone can imagine a strawberry. And then from there, you, like, they make that kind of connection, like, strawberries are sweet maybe our song strawberry is sweet i think i think, I so. think we are we're all about like using uh imagery that everyone likes like whether it's like if we felt like getting into using pizza or chinese food as imagery we would do that because you know honestly who disagrees with pizza and chinese food and fruit being good well i just noticed you had you know fruit in some of the song titles is like tangerine and strawberries and then there's fruit like spread out on the cover, there's like a banana and an orange and yeah. I think uh, honestly, the for the song title, so the, actually for the album cover, we just thought the fruit would look good and that, that the color would contrast really well with the green and the grass and the background with the picnic. Um, for these song titles, those are a bit more personal, I guess. Um, with uh, tangerines, um, that's a sadder song. Um, tangerines is something that I don't know. It's like it's like sharing like a cutie. Like, hey, you want a tangerine? And you know, the person's like, yeah. Like everyone, no one's gonna turn down a tangerine, as well as a strawberry. No one's gonna turn down a strawberry. But I will say for strawberry, um, a lot of people think that song is about like uh, I don't know, like chopping up a fruit salad or you know, being in love and stuff. But it's about a serial killer. So I was willing to text her at the time. <laughs> Table, you're pure and untouched. 
Uh, oh, I've, I've seen every episode of Dexter. Yeah. Speaking speaking of of shows, I was wondering whether you guys were happy that Gendry got Storm's End. Uh, oh, dude, yeah. I'm so fucking happy. I called that shit out from three years ago. Oh yeah. <laughs> who, uh, like who? When I saw that, my jaw hit the floor. I started jumping around and screaming. I was with my girlfriend at the time. I lost my shit. It was like called it in a Fernat song. Book it. <laughs> we we have that on record. <laughs> yeah, that that's awesome. Although he, you know, he hasn't gotten the girl yet, so it's kind of kind of a tough look for for our guy Gendry. In that to, last quote, to quote the Lonely Island, it doesn't matter, head sick. <laughs> Gendry. It's <laughs> uh, on TV. It's yeah. HBO. It's the Baratheon way to be turned on by Stark. Dude, <laughs> damn. A Griffin yeah. with the lore moment right there. Although, you know, in the first episode, they're talking about, you know, Robert's talking about getting their, their children together. Not referring, obviously, to, to Arya and Gendry, but... No, but it, it happened. They joined their houses. I know the quote. Yeah. It, it, it happened in the end. I thought that, you know, I, I was not expecting that when I was listening to the album. I'm like, um, I, I am definitely a, a, a Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire, like, uber fan. Actually, that's, yeah. a, that's a funny, like, short story. The, I, got, I got to uh, the house where we all hang out, and the guys were like, hey, we have this cool, like, 30-second clip. It's just like this sound effect. We put a bunch of effects on. Can you think of something to say for 30 seconds over it? And I was like, well... I have this pretty highly upvoted like post on Reddit about a theory I have on Game of Thrones. I, why don't I just summarize <laughs> that? Remember at the end of season two of Game of Thrones when Gendry just sails off into the ocean in his rowboat? What if he just like came back with an army and took over his dad, Bobby Baratheon's castle in, in the Stormlands? Like, what would Cersei do? What would Daenerys do? Everyone would be so confused. Yeah, Curzaz just says a bunch of weird shit, so we were like, you know, who would be perfect for Aaron Bentley? Yeah, man, I just talk. I have a bad singing voice, so I might as well talk about something nerdy that I'm passionate about. Andy, um, since this is, is coming out before the last two episodes, um, anything that you want to call now? Any <laughs> any deep dive like theories that you want to go to? It, right, doesn't, my, it doesn't have to be main character or, or main thing at all. No, nothing be, super, you know. nothing super deep. Because honestly, I've been disappointed with the show in terms of depth in this season as a book reader. But calling it, Daenerys is dead. Jon's gonna take the throne, and then something's gonna happen to him. Then he's gonna be gone, and Sansa's on the throne at the end. Fucking book it. I think the finale will end with Bran modern day in a Starbucks. <laughs> and uh, he's just chilling, and he wards back, puts a Starbucks cup there, gets all <laughs> the editors from HBO, everyone fired from the spinoffs we're going to do, and boom, it's a reality TV show. Yeah, I'm, I'm with it. Pro- also, probably. the Hound needs to fight his brother. Kugain Bull has to have Yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah, Kugain Bull, get out the air horns, everybody. Kugain Bull is happening. Well, if you ask me, I hope to see the wheel broken. I hope to see the the throne destroyed, and you know, Same. and and we have a a more democratic realm. And and I really do hope to see John John live and uh and be reunited with Ghost, and and That'd give Ghost and give Ghost the love 
he fucking deserves. The ghost got his ear fucking blown off. <laughs> and he's okay. not getting anything for it. Here's here's my here's my theory. Brienne goes, fuck it, fuck this, fuck Jamie. Goes Let's up north. Me. She's like Tormund, I'm here. <laughs> Take me, <laughs> Tormund. <laughs> Uh, she deserves it at this point. This she really does. Yep, better, 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 better than Sheila. That's, That's true. Sure. But thinking about Game of Thrones, and if the government collapsed, do you really think it would turn into like some kind of cool democracy? Like that universe, everyone's fucking crazy. Like, so it would just be a bloodbath. Yeah, but Sam and Frodo are gonna drop the ring and. <laughs> No, but we're all, we're always better off with a more localized government. You know, the more local the government, the 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 better. So, That's true. That's what um, the Targaryens fixed, and maybe everyone else is going to unfix it by making it more localized again, balkanize yeah. the Westeros. That's what I say. So I, I'm I'm all for like a free North, you know, ruled by the North. Same thing with the Iron Islands. With uh-huh. you know, Dorn, all of it. They 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 should all rule themselves, and then you know some sort of some sort of loose alliance mm-hmm. of of, of hey. states or countries. I mean, I'm all for some sort of anarcho-socialist <laughs> utopia, dude. Let's just let's just make Bernie Sanders president of Western. <laughs> so. Let, let, let's not just an skip a couple socialist. steps and go for the good best start. of reality. <laughs> I un- want UBI un- too. Unburn. Bernie 2020. Yeah, the unburn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Feeling the unburn. <laughs> yeah, Bernie 2020. While while we have this platform, I'll shout that one out. <laughs> All right. So so back to the music uh, a little bit. Um, in terms of how that album turned out, what were like what are what are your favorite songs to, to listen to off the album? What are, what are your favorite songs to play? I will say before anybody who was actually on that album answers, Tangerine was my go-to song whenever I was feeling like a, like a side boy, and I will forever stand that song. Lost in translation, I don't understand.
as someone who's in the band, I think Tangerine is probably the best sounding song recording wise on the album, but Dreams is probably my favorite. Okay, um, I think my favorite song on that album, like to listen to, oh God, this, this feels a little like conceited to say, but it's probably Dan. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one song I get to, like, I take lead vocals on, and I just. Actually, no, I feel like, okay, so that is the one that I definitely enjoy playing live the most because I get to take live vocals, I take lead vocals for it. And usually we do it at the end of the end of the set, so I'm able to kind of go like, okay, this is it. I can go all out and everyone's going to love it. Um, but then to listen to, um, that's kind of, I feel like, honestly, it might be train spotted. And maybe it's because of the associations I just have with the song. I think that was like one of the first songs that we'd like written for that album. That was the first song I ever and practiced with you guys on drums. There, there yeah, it is. Yeah, so like because, because of the associations I have with that song and just like I, even if it doesn't like I think, you know, when we play it live it definitely sounds better than the recorded version, but like still I can I hear the recorded version and I can kind of think about all of the work that's gone into it, how many turns it's taken. It's just, it's kind of nice to finally like listen to it and hear it all come to fruition, you know? I think, uh, I think my favorite song off that album is probably, honestly, honestly the one I probably listen to most is the interlude. Uh, <laughs> for, for me, for me, it's like, I wrote all the songs like the really the skeleton structure of those songs in like high school and and now it's like you know three years later four years later so now I'm like okay I don't really like any of these songs um, I think you know maybe uh, maybe as a fool I think I'm a better vocalist now than I was then uh, you're better <laughs> thank you Chris but uh, you know I I think um, the interlude is like the one I show to people I'm like hey like you know, I'm like, my band's all right. Like, you know, if you like, it's <laughs> here's, here's a fucking interlude to our album. Um, but as far, as far as structurally, I like Strawberry the best, I think. Um, Strawberry is one that I had a lot of fun writing. And that was like the first song I kind of challenged myself to write um, on things not as immediate. Or it was, the one, it, was, it was probably the one I had the most fun writing. Um I think I also, I also had a lot of fun writing "Damn Lady" because it wasn't like in my head it wasn't me singing it; it was Griffin. So it was one of those songs where it was like, okay, like yeah, maybe like how do I write a song for another person? Um, and then I mean, it just kind of just kind of happened. Um, even though it's really simple, it's probably the simplest song on the album. Um, as far as that goes, as far as musically, it's like you know five chords, you know four and a half probably. But it's just a lot of fun live, and yeah, yeah. To piggyback off that, actually, "Strawberry" is a great fucking song, and I'll agree with both of them that "Damn Lady" is probably the fun time to play live from that album. Thank you. Backing off of that real quick, um, whenever I listen to Strawberry, I'm just like, oh my god, why is it so slow? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was just thinking. When I first showed my like my a lot of my friends and my family that song, they were like, 
We're 50, and this is slow. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know what BPM was. I didn't know what the fuck this was. was. So when I was like, is this, is this BPM all right? I was like, you know what? Yeah. And then uh, it's kind of happened. I think we played a lot. We don't really play it live anymore, but when we did play it live, we played it a lot faster. Sean is smart, but he can't really count to four. He can barely <laughs> count to six. At least not evenly. Well, for most for most bands, all you really have to do is is be able to count to four. So you can do that. We're working on we it. count to yeah, four and we count to six, so we switch between the two a lot. I just count yeah. over. Play, really playing playing in no. playing in six is always tough. Yeah. Well, what's really funny is Sean will be like adamant that a song is in four four, and we're like, Sean, the song is in six eight, just, just, and you just don't know what you're talking about. It's like count like one and two and three and, and it'll make a lot more sense. <laughs> four four is the only time signature that matters. It doesn't really make sense to me. I'm gonna stick by it. I don't care if it's in three four, six eight, twelve. 13, you know. I remember one time, I forget which song it was, but we pra- I think it was Tonight. We started practicing a Tonight one day, and we played for a solid, like, two or three run-throughs, and Griffin's like, this, this is not feeling right. I don't know what's going on. And then I look at him, like, guys, the song is in 6-8. And Griffin's just like, oh, right. And then Sean's just like, what? <laughs> uh, I actually agree with Sean, 4-4 four, four for life, dude. Uh, oh, yeah. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> okay, so to anyone who might be dis- like disheartened from listening to us because of this, just let it be known that the actual rhythm section <laughs> does in fact know the difference between 4-4 four, four and 6-8. Where it matters. Hey, guitar is where it's at, baby. Yeah. yeah. Vocal- <laughs> no, one, no one ever thinks the vocalist knows how to count. Like, no one expects that of them, so. I don't even sing live. I use a backing track, so. Yeah. <laughs> So was it, was it hard to um, to carry on the band like after high school and and going to college and and that whole thing has, so, has it been a challenge? I I, would, I honestly um, I've seen a lot where bands break up after you know after they're not on the same geographic location. I think with us, I think with me it was easy because I knew I like always wanted to like play with these guys. Um, they're giving me a real sweet looks right now. But, it goes yeah. back to the start where we were all talking about how we're friends. Um, but yeah, like it was a thing where it's like, um, you know, I like playing with these guys. Uh, when I went down to VCU, I was like, okay, now we can play in Richmond more often. Uh, it was never like, okay, I mean, it's, I mean, it's definitely harder than if we were all in the same house or if we were all in the same neighborhood. But at the same time, um, especially with technology how it is nowadays where we have group chat on like three different mediums. Um and, you know, we're not like we're not really stressed about anything as a band. Like we we do it because we have fun and if something comes out of it that's bigger than having fun then you know, yeah, we're down for it. But I think Honestly. I think we get we're really lucky in that um we have a really good cohesion cohesion with each other and um like w- because of the distance between sean and the rest of us um you know sometimes we'll go a fair amount of time without practicing but like at the end of the day um we we're, like i don't know i can't really speak for anyone else but for me like any of our songs they're, they're it's, it's a muscle memory thing i just kind of have them at this point so it doesn't matter like it's it's not like we have to worry worry too much about having like a good routine. It ends up just being like, hey, we have the show that we're we're gonna we've agreed that we can play at this time. Let's like all meet up and then like right before we can run through everything, make sure we're all on the same page, and then just go and do it. And I think that really helps a lot because we don't have to worry about things like oh, I, I, that's. I feel a little pretentious saying that, but if anything, uh, all four of us like not living uh, either in the same house or right on top of each other has helped us because it's never given us an opportunity to have a major argument between band members. <laughs> like we all just get to be friends and live apart from each other and be friends and play Dungeons and Dragons and uh, make music and like hang out and just have a good time. 
and we don't have to have the drama of real life crashing in because we don't live together. And there's no stakes to our relationship other than being in the Fernet. Yeah, but I mean, and and you got to think of that like Kurtz doesn't have a belly button, which is obviously like. Also, also, also in addition to not having a belly button, I was born on Easter Sunday. I'd like to state. So I, I might be a miracle. I might not. I might be the second coming. It's up to you to decide. Weird flex, but okay. <laughs> so what? Other than <laughs> other than bringing back the, the New Jerusalem, um, what is? <laughs> What is the Don't direction? Oh man! <laughs> for Sorry, the, what, was the, what was what is the direction for the band? Like, what are you guys? Um, That's up to Sean. Oh, we're probably right. breaking up next week, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, if you're going to ask anyone about direction, that would probably be Sean, since he writes the lyrics and the chords. So, Sean, what are we doing? Is it funk? Is that it? As far as are you asking as far as like music or just, yeah, you know, I mean what are, what are, what are you guys what are you guys listening to right now? What kind of car seat you know what, car, what, what car are, seat headrest literally garbage music. I, I will I'm agree sorry. with Um So <laughs> finish wait wait I'm sorry. Could you finish your question? Okay, I was gonna say I, what what. What songs do you have that are that are coming out, and and what are you know sort of the, the the basis for those songs, and where can we expect to to hear you play them? So we've got a whole dang album coming out. Um, it's being mastered right now, actually, um, as we speak. And uh, yeah, so it's gonna be eleven songs. Um, uh, and it's basically kind of showcasing, you know, I think El Dorado was really basic starter, you know, if we were like a cancer region, uh, I think El Dorado would be Bulbasaur and, you know, Fear Not was probably like Ivysaur, like kind of the evolution of it. And then you have this new album which is probably like the final evolution dinosaur, but then, you know, you saw like the mega evolution and stuff coming up. Um, but anyway, you know, I think this new album coming up is really going to showcase us pushing our boundaries and like kind of what we're comfortable with songwriting wise. Uh, we, we're not really sure when it's going to be released, probably around July. I'd, I'd say mid to late summer would be a good guess. <laughs> yeah, but we have a single out. Um, on Spotify, Apple, all the streaming music services. Um, no cassettes, though. Yeah, the, hope, we'll, we'll see when the whole album's out. We'll see if we can make that happen. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think basically speaking, we're kind of diving more into what can we do outside of what we've already done, which I guess is what all bands do. But I mean, the whole thing is recorded, but I don't know if I'm supposed to tease this. We're putting it, we're, there's going to be another interlude. So, I don't know. It, it might not be Game of Thrones related at all, but it's going to happen. It might happen. Hopefully, it's going to happen. The guys, um, I'll just talk about Game of Thrones again. I don't care. <laughs> uh, uh, to kind of elaborate on what Sean and Curtis have said, to me, like, with this new album, it's kind of been, like, uh, a situation where it's, like, when you listen to... When you listen to our first our first EP or our first full length album, it's like yes, you can hear the songs and you can connect it to our band and everything like that. But like, I don't know. I, I personally, whenever I hear them, it doesn't sound like something that like like any of the other songs that I usually listen to. Um, it, but I think with this next album, it's something that I would like if it, if I was just a random person who wasn't involved in the Furnace. It would have. It would be an album that I would actually listen to and enjoy, and I wouldn't think of it differently than any other album that I'm listening to on Spotify or Apple Music or anything like that. Um, which is kind of important to me, at least as a musician. You know, I want. I want to make sure that other people can will be able to listen to this and kind of think, oh, these are just run of the mill musicians. There's nothing like lower about them or anything like that even though we're maybe not putting as much money into it it's reaching a certain level of quality you know 
Um, I think it's it, that's just kind of it's we're trying to mature as musicians at the end of the day, um, always. And I think this is just another step in that direction. I, to- I totally agree. I'm I'm really excited about the the way all of our new music sounds, and I'm really excited about how much better the music sounds. Like the literal audio fidelity of it. It, it sounds good on whatever systems we've listened to it on. I'm excited. People can listen to it and be like, not all the way like, oh, wow, this is super pro record deal quality, but it's it's definitely a step up from our previous releases, so I'm excited. Well, I like the way that the last album sounded, so I hope it doesn't go too far from your roots. You'll still be, you'll still, no, that's, you'll yeah, still be happy, I'm sure. We've got... I feel- yeah, I don't want to discount everything else that we've done, but, you know, there's always room for improvement, you know, and I think we found a little bit of room there with this next album. I'm just really excited to be able to show it to people and say, you know, this is the next step that we've taken, and then, you know, who knows where we're going to go next. Well, so are you guys are you guys playing Richmond? Um, are you going to go anywhere else on, right. on the East Coast? I, we're I know actually you playing said- a number of different shows. Um, in the in the near future. Um, in general, Richmond's our spot, though. Yeah, Rich, That's Richmond like 80% is eighty percent of our shows are probably in Richmond. Richmond is very kind to us. Yes, but like um, in the near future, I mean, we're playing Electric Maid in DC on, on Wednesday next I don't know Wednesday, if that's gonna, the fifteenth. Yeah, we're probably we're probably a little late for like you know Promotion. publishing this. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that's gonna you know <laughs> maybe. Uh, in uh in August we're going on a seventeen day tour. Um kinda all over. We're going to start in Nashville and go down to Georgia and South Carolina, North Carolina, you know, see some alligators and then, you know, go up north to end up in Brooklyn. And we're going on that tour with like really good friends from New York, uh Fox Hollow. It's a really good band. And- up uh, more up your alley in June. We're gonna play a show here in Reston at a undisclosed oh, yeah. underground location. Um, that is gonna be very fun and very awesome and very very Reston DIY. Yeah, actually, this is totally up I, your alley. I, like, I, I just didn't know when the right time to kind of pitch this would be, but like, yeah, um, June sixteenth. Um, it's gonna be us and then Cold Beaches, who are also. She's also a wrestling native, but um, she lives in Chicago now, but she's coming back, and it's going to be a great thing. And we have, oh, my God, we have two other bands whose names are escaping me right now. Yeah, Nah. Nah, yes. And then there was another one whose name is still escaping me, unfortunately. But both of them are also local bands, so that's going to be a great time for everyone, the musicians and the listeners. Um, and that would be a great opportunity to hear some of the newer stuff that we're doing because honestly, like for the past year, like we've had these stuff, these things written and pretty much done. It's just a matter of, you know, getting the recordings out and everything like that. So we've been like playing a lot of our new stuff live more than we have been being not faded home with the other event. So it's going to be the Fernats, Nah, Faded Home and Cold Beaches on June 16th. Here in Reston. Yeah. In, in a rest in basement show, which are the best shows. Absolutely, and we're pretty yeah. much the only people that put those on anymore. So, well, as far as we as know, as maybe, we know, maybe we're not cool enough for the. Maybe other there's ones. someone super underground that's just like digging under us and putting on these shows. <laughs> well, that you know, my my listeners will be happy to hear that there are still shows like that going on in rest in. It's very far between, the, but we do what we can with the police, I guess. He, <laughs> people people will be thrilled that that's to hear that that's still happening with the kids and um hopefully if if you guys are playing in July if there's any chance you know you are welcome to uh to play a, at a jam for man and and be able to say that that you play jam for man so we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep a spot warm for you if you're able to make it to the the jam for man show in July Sounds great. Keep that very hot, yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's gonna be hot. There, there oh, gonna beautiful. Be, there gonna be, <laughs> I, I'm sweating yeah, already. No, I, this is getting uncomfortable, <laughs> honestly. 
But it's it's going to be, I think, four bands uh, at least of, you know, Reston natives who played the original Jam for Man shows. So you get a chance to to hear some of some of those guys. And, and oh, that sounds there. amazing. Yeah, we're yeah. Awesome. Yeah. You can't see us, but we're literally all looking. Yeah, at we're just like looking at each other, nodding, like yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, we're we're totally in. That sounds. And great. what they're doing today, so that that would be awesome to have you be a part of it because it 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 would be really cool for you know the the history of Reston and sort of like modern Reston to 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 get together and you know just rock the shit out of a place. That'd be very awesome, man. We're excited. And and for a good cause, too. Absolutely. Well, listen, guys, 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 it has been uh, an honor to have you on the show. You guys are... Um, wonderful being here. You guys, you guys are great. I love what you're doing. I love the fact that, you know, you're, you're keeping live music going and, and resting, and I really hope to get a chance to, to see you guys play live, because that's you know, that's what we want to want to hear. Live music. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Your You're awesome. been yeah. wonderful. You don't have to trust in yourself. Well, I don't think I trust you myself.